The cosmology of Dungeons and Dragons is designed such that when you die, your soul gets sent to the plane that corresponds the most to it. If you live a lawful good life, your soul might get sent to Mount Celestia, where the lawful good gods reside. But if you're lawful evil, then you might get sent all the way down to the Nine Hells, where you will be tortured and turned into a devil. This, however, is not the only way you might actually end in hell. Through trickery or through trade, you might end up making a deal with a devil whereupon your soul might be given to a lord of hell in exchange for power. This is by itself not rare at all. In fact, millions of mortals dedicate themselves all the time to their favorite god in order to guarantee entrance into their respective heavens when they die. But the devils constantly invade the mortal realm and trick innocents who otherwise might have made it into heaven into selling their souls to the lords of hell. Yet the angels do not do anything about this. There is indeed a cosmic war, but it is not between the angels and the devils, but instead between the devils and the demons. And the angels are more than happy to let this be, even if it costs them. Through this video, we will talk about the reality of the Nine Hells, of the Cosmos, of Asmodeus, and we will uncover some of the greatest secrets in Dungeons and Dragons. The Nine Hells is formed by nine different layers, which together form the shape of an inverted mountain, an inverted mountain whose name is Bator. So in reality, the actual name is the Nine Layers of Bator, and its inhabitants are the Batesu, who you might recognize as the devils. Each layer is different from the next, and each of them is governed by a devil lord, all the way to the leader of leaders, who is Asmodeus, who rules from his throne in the ninth layer. Now, Asmodeus is the only one with any actual power, as the other lords were simply put in their positions by him, and given just enough power in order to be able to rule. They are extraordinarily powerful devils, but by no means are they gods, or even greater or lesser powers. They all dedicate themselves to the Lord of Hell in body and mind, and vow themselves to him, at least as a front. Some of them wish nothing more than to usurp him, but none of them even come close to having as much power as he does in order to actually make it happen. Like I said, Asmodeus is the only one with any real power in here, having absolute authority over the hells. He's able to change the landscape at will, control anything within it, and he's the only devil with the power to create arch devils. How much power does he actually possess, however, is impossible to tell, mostly because he is in fact not a god. See, typically a god gets more power Powerful, the more servants he has, so the more clerics that a god possesses, the more powerful he is. Respectively, if a god loses servants or clerics, the weaker he becomes. This is not the case for Asmodeus, which makes it impossible to compare it to deities. He simply doesn't fit any criteria for categorization. This is compounded by the fact that he is surrounded by myths and fables, to the point where nobody truly knows how old he is or where he came from. In fact, if you're a cleric and you were to ask your god about Asmodeus, your god wouldn't even know what to tell you other than just repeating the same stories that everyone already talks about. Out of all of the common stories, the most popular and the one agreed upon by scholars is the Fallen Angel story. The story tells of great wars against the demons back in the dawn of time, where Asmodeus used to not be just any angel, but the most beautiful and the most powerful of all angels. He was an instrument to the gods, a leader amongst the fighting angels whose job was to destroy the demons. The fight against the demons, however, changed Asmodeus and his fellow warriors, turning them reddish with horns and forking their tongues. Such a transformation was magically made through the millennia slowly in order to to better help them fight these demons, sort of like a form of evolution. The gods didn't like this though, for their shape was, were ugly and stained their beautiful heavens. But Asmodeus and his legions hadn't done anything wrong. They were for all intents and purposes champions of law against chaos and so the gods couldn't kick them out. Asmodeus eventually however tricked the gods into creating a plane for him, a location that he and his armies could use as a front for the war against the demons, a front far away from the heavens. That way, Asmodeus could serve his purpose on the greater cosmos without filling the heavens with demonic blood. Asmodeus also tricked the gods into allowing him the ability to conscript the souls of mortals for the army. Of course, as long as he followed the law while doing this. I say these were all tricks because the arguments that Asmodeus presented to the gods were all very reasonable and logical, yet of course, the Lord of Lies had something else completely in mind and tricked the gods into giving him his own plane where he could become powerful with the souls that he dominated. 
This story, like I said, is definitely the most popular one, and it is the one that clerics and gods and scholars agree upon the most. There are many stories, however, yet they all see him as being right there in the beginning of things. They all see him as having betrayed the gods and then having fallen. However, the actual facts of what we really do know about Asmodeus can be summarized as such. Asmodeus is indeed at the beginning of things, uh, before the worlds were even created. He is indeed stuck in hell for one reason or another and cannot escape. He is the embodiment of law even though he is evil, law is at his core and that is inescapable. He exemplifies order in its strongest and truest forms. He fights law and order in the front lines of the cosmos against the demons, a battle that he is very very proud of and all devils are actually very proud of. He is immensely scarred and most of his body is filled with bizarre wounds. The oldest of entities in the known universe know that Asmodeus actually fell from the heavens and into Bator. Not like a metaphorical fall, as in like a fall from grace, but like a literal boom, he fell into the ground kind of fall. And lastly, Asmodeus is not a god and has never been a god. He cannot give spells to his clerics like a normal god does. Now, these are just the facts that we know about Asmodeus, and you would have noticed that some of these facts actually contradict the story that we just talked about. Asmodeus is, after all, the god of lies, and everything that we know about him, and you will figure that out real quick, everything is just a big lie. I would be remiss not to mention, however, that he is currently a god, thanks to the events that unfolded in the novel released recently. He basically ate a god and now has godly powers, but I am specifically talking about his past when I mentioned that he has a lack of divinity. The, the crux of this is that his powers do not come from a deific status, but actually come straight from him, which is not something that is completely understood in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, the devil lords from the Nine Hells they truly believe that if they were to usurp Asmodeus and take his throne on Nessus, that they would actually obtain the powers from hell, when in reality, that couldn't be further from the truth. Asmodeus is not mighty and powerful because of his ownership of the plane, though I am sure that he gains some power from that. This is, however, the first lie that we will talk about when referring to the Lord of Lies. A single lie on an ocean of deceit that pertains to the greatest illusion that he commands. In this case, Asmodeus is happy having everyone else believe that he isn't as strong as he actually is, allowing his devil lords to believe that they could potentially usurp him. See, from an, from an outside perspective, when you see Bator, when you see Asmodeus, you see an image of weakness. You see a, a demigod who is struggling to keep all of his minions together. You see a demigod who doesn't really have as much power. And this is an imagery that he actually wants to maintain. Surprisingly, this also applies to the Blood War the war between the devils and the demons. See, in reality, Asmodeus could have won this war millennia ago, but he doesn't want to. In fact, he gathers with his commanders four times every year to discuss the war, at which point he literally lies to his commanders about what points to take, which strategies to use, and which fronts to fight for. He lies to his commanders in order to force the war to keep going. His goal is indeed to maintain the fronts just as they are, and keep the war going for as long as possible. The reason for this is yet another misdirection. He wants to keep everyone's eyes on the Great War and away from him. At least, until he's ready. But ready for what? What is it that he is doing that requires so much secrecy? You will quickly find out that almost everything is a lie. Not just his reflection of weakness, not just the blood war, but even the nine hells is a lie. Nessus is a lie. Even Asmodeus himself is a lie. This is the avatar that Asmodeus chooses to use, a persona he chose for the purposes of interacting with the inhabitants of these worlds. His real shape, however, is very, very different. Suffice to say that there is only one living entity in all of creation at this moment that actually knows his real form. Bator, as you know it, is also really a bit different. See, every plane constitutes a specific alignment. In the case of Hell, well, lawful evil. A person that dies that is lawful evil would land in hell, like we described in the beginning of the video. Where you go after you die is reflective of the beliefs and actions 
while you're alive. This being the case, there are obviously a few exceptions. Like for example, what happens if you die as a baby? What happens if you're born and live on a mountain or in a forest and never really have a chance to show a real alignment or never really have the chance to pledge yourself to a god? Or even yet, what happens if you actually do pledge yourself to a god but then that god dies, which happens all the time? What do you do then? What happens then? If any of these apply to you, then you become what is known as a faithless. Essentially a mortal without a divine patron. When you die, there is nobody to claim you, nowhere for you to go, and as such you end up in the fugue plane for the rest of your years until you basically disappear and become part of the plane itself. On the other hand, if you pledged yourself to a god, but then betrayed said god or, or failed to meet its standards and dogmas, then when you die, you are judged by Kelimvor, the god of the dead and the judge of the damned. If he finds you guilty of this, then you become what is known as a false, sentenced then to punishment for all eternity depending on the severity of the crime. This is the way of things. This is the way that things have always been. However, there is a great secret within this framework. A portion of souls that are kind of unaccounted for. See, to be considered faithless, you have to be for a lack of a better word, agnostic. You either need to not be able to believe in a god or just didn't particularly put any emphasis into believing in a god. But then there are those who actively shun the gods. There are those who have understanding of the gods but refuse to bow down to them. Those that seek to undermine the gods at every turn. We're talking about real atheism in Dungeons and Dragons. The question then would be, well, where do the souls of atheists go? These souls go to Nessus, the ninth layer of the nine hells. Normal, lawful, evil souls go to any of the other eight layers, including those who sell their souls to devils. But nobody, nobody ever goes to Nessus except only the atheists. But they are not just sent to any part of this layer. They're sent to the farthest, deepest reaches of this infinite world, farther down than even the pit lords ever go to, to the place unknown to any, but only Asmodeus. For this is where Asmodeus is. The avatar that you might find of Asmodeus in Malshim, the fortress of Nessus, is not his true form, it's not even his true self. His real self, his real form, is all the way down here in the serpent's coil, a collection of passages and cracks on the ground with labyrinthine layers. The souls of the atheists find themselves pitted in the darkest reaches, directly in front of Asmodeus, who sits alone in the darkness, bleeding and hurt, and who devours the souls sent to him. The souls are eaten for hundreds of years as every piece of the soul, every memory of the soul, every fiber of its being gets slowly bitten and slowly digested while the soul is completely aware of it happening and without being able to do anything about it. Feeling itself being absorbed as slowly as everything around it slowly disappears. Asmodeus does this to mend its wounds, as it is the only thing he can do to fix his broken body. A body that not even the devils that live in Nessus know about. The body, the real body of Asmodeus, is that of a snake. A titan-sized snake hundreds of miles long. And like we mentioned before, the only living entity in the cosmos who knows this is a singular one. The god of the Quattles. Jasurian. This is not lore that you can find in 5th edition. This is not even lore that you can find on 4th or 3rd edition lore books. What you actually instead find in there are more myths and legends and stories meant to sort of keep the reality of Asmodeus, but also of the Nine Hells and a lot of other different topics. They're meant to keep them ambiguous. Why? Because this is not lore that necessarily matters when it comes to your typical Dungeons and Dragons campaign. This is not the type of thing that you would need if you were to play Rise of Tiamat. A lot of Dungeons and Dragons is just filled with a lot of secret hidden lore that it's not necessarily meant to ever be found. And hence, a lot of this lore is hidden. 
bunched up with myths and legends to cover it up. In fact, you would have to go about 19 years ago in order to start finding the lore that I just told you about. And when you, when you do find it, you would find some pretty weird and disturbing things. Don't they say that if you know a devil's true name, then you obtain power over that devil? Would you think that Asmodeus is indeed his true name? Well, of course not. When you actually think about it, it really wouldn't make much sense for him to openly use his real name, would it? His real name is actually Araman. And with Jasirian, the two of them used to be champions back before the universe was formed. When the universe was nothing but swirling, uncontrolled chaos, powerful entities formed themselves from it. And before you knew it, these powerful entities would go to fight each other. The champions from this beginning chaos were none other than Jasirian and Ariman, the very foundations of law, for that is what they represented. In a world without dimension, in a world without physicality, intentions and feelings are very, very powerful, especially when everything is malleable using your own head. And Jasirian and Ariman represented the very intentions of law and order, and these intentions triumphed everything else. It was then, by conjoining together in dual Ouroboros, by biting each other's tails and combining their powers, that they formed the universe as we know it. They set the laws of the universe, they set the boundaries of the universe, they formed the famous and powerful rule of three, signifying the power of good, evil, and law. When it became time for them to conclude creation, they couldn't settle on the center of the universe. Jasirian, who was lawful and good, wanted Mount Celestia to be the center of the world, whereas Ariman, who was lawful and evil, wanted Bator to be the center of the world. So each attempted to pull each other in their respective directions, Jasirian trying to pull up, whereas Ariman tried to pull down, and keep in mind they were still holding each other's tails in their mouths and by pulling each other hard enough, they eventually ripped each other's tails. Jasirian was winged and feathered, so he flew up, whereas Ariman fell down. From the blood of Jasirian, the first coatls were formed, and from the blood of Ariman, the first pit fiends were created. Jasirian was safe as he could fly, but Ariman could not, and so he fell, and fell, and fell. He didn't stop falling even after he hit Bator, and through the ground he went, and kept on falling and falling and falling, crushing everything in its path until eventually the ground stopped him, all the way down in Nessus into the very dark depths of the cosmos. The cracks and passages in Nessus are the holes he left when he fell, the snake-shaped holes that are now called the Serpent's Coil. This wounded Ariman greatly, to the point where even after uncountable millennia he has yet to heal, Ariman quickly understood his weakness and hid in plain sight. By assuming a different form and a different name, he has been absorbing the souls of others since then in order to heal his broken body. Because Jazirian and Ariman never settled on a center of the universe, the planes continue to reach infinitely, without an end ironically producing chaos where order should have been, which leads to the four corners of the metaphysical reality of this universe. Law, chaos, good, and evil. Since then, both creators have been keeping low, since there really hasn't been any reason for them to show their true colors. Jasirian is content, very happy, to rule his realm in Mount Celestia, taking care of his coatl sons, whereas Araman has been spending this entire time trying to nurture its body back to health, waiting until the time where he might be able to accomplish his ultimate plan, Armageddon. See, Araman is stuck in Bator because of the very laws he helped create. What the laws are exactly are unknown, though it is believed that the creators were originally intended to stay at the center of the universe and not leave, and because Araman said Bator as his center, he's stuck there now. If he were to leave, then the laws of the universe would break and the outer planes would start dissolving, 
creating once again the Dawn of Chaos. In this Dawn of Chaos, both Jasirian and Ariman would be king, like they were before. They have been there before, and they have succeeded where everyone else failed. However, as it stands right now, Ariman is too weak currently in order to survive in that ocean of chaos, and so he seeks to heal himself. Yasirian knows of this, but believes that there is still enough law in Ariman for him to enact Armageddon. For as much as Ariman would want to destroy it all in order to recreate it, that would be, in a sense, breaking his own laws, which at the very core of its being, it's antithetical to its very existence. He was born and molded by law and order. Even though evil and self-serving, order must still be maintained at all costs. Yasirian knows this, and so he also bides his time waiting and hoping that Ariman will not seek to destroy it all, even though he technically could. Whenever he would want.